series, and uh, this is part three, the response, repent and believe in the gospel. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you'll find uh, your place in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. If you do not own a Bible uh, or forgot to bring one with you, if you can't put it up on your device, your phone, uh, we do have Bibles on the connect table out back that we give away. If you don't have one, we'd love for you to take it and make that your own as a gift to Crawford Baptist Church. But Mark chapter 1, this morning, verses 14 and 15, as we continue our fall series, Redeemed, How Jesus Changes Everything. And I ask you to stand as we read just these two verses. We will be flipping over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 in a few moments. But if you'll find Mark 1, 14 and 15 for right now. Notice the word of the Lord. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let me pray. Father, would you bless now our time of study. Father, here at Crawford Baptist Church, we love the Bible. We love the Word of God. We love the Scriptures. And we're here now to learn with our minds and to be motivated in our hearts, God, to to, Lord, uh, live a lives that glorify you, and we acknowledge that only through the Holy Spirit can we do that. As John 15, 5 teaches all of us, for, for apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus has said. And so, Holy Spirit, help me preach, and Holy Spirit, help us all hear your voice and your truth and be transformed by it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated this morning. So keep your Bible open again. We're starting in Mark 1, verses 14 15. We're going to jump over very soon to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and one verse there as well. And the question before us this morning uh, is this. The first question, at least, is this. How do you know that you trusted in Christ for salvation? You celebrate Christmas. You go to church on Easter. You were baptized as a child. You grew up going to church. And now you're doing your best ever since, trying to live a good, decent, moral life, trying to be a moral person. For many people, that's how they answer the question that is posed this morning. How do you know that you trusted in Christ for salvation, for actual salvation, for what we call biblical salvation? You see, here's the problem today. Our culture seems to be okay with us calling ourselves Christians, right? And yet there is no tangible, uh, no qualitative difference in our lives from those who don't even claim to know Christ at all. But the Bible will not let us get away with calling ourselves Christians without the fruit of faith. And the Bible teaches that the fruit of faith is repentance. The fruit of faith is repentance. And a lot of people today, and maybe you've heard of this argument, maybe you've even posed this as a, a response to, to those Bible-thumping, fundamentalist-type Christians, okay? Maybe you've heard this. A lot of people today think that repentance uh, was an Old Testament concept. A lot of people today believe that repentance was for those uh, Jews, especially who were living under the Old Testament law. It's not for us today. Uh, we live in the age of grace. See, John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, came eating uh, honey-coated bugs, dressed in camel's hair, clothing with a leather belt, and he came preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Mark chapter 1, verse 4, it records John's message. He came proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But see, that's John the Baptist. That's Old Testament. Jesus didn't do that, did he? That's, that's the big sentiment. That Jesus is unlike the God of the Old Testament, the God of anger and wrath and law and holding people to keeping the rules, the Ten Commandments and all the other 613 laws that you can find in the Old Testament. Jesus was kind of about love. And allowing people to think and do their own thing. And, and, but what we need to understand, biblically speaking, is this. The ministry of Jesus Christ was, was, was not fluttering about, sprinkling love dust 
on everyone. That's not what he was doing. In fact, the ministry of Jesus Christ was one of calling men, women, boys, and girls to repent. If you want to be saved, you have to repent. Again, in John, in Mark chapter 1, rather, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus comes, and what does he say? The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. In fact, the king of the kingdom, y'all, is standing in front of you. It's time to repent and believe in the gospel. And we studied that in Sermon 1 in our series. The gospel means good news. And good news does not occur in a vacuum. Good news always invades bad spaces. And bad news, it displaces the bad news. And the bad news is that everything is broken, including you and me. The good news is the remedy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What you could not do for yourself, God did it in Christ for sinners. That's the remedy. That's the good news of the gospel. And so we need to understand there's no dichotomy between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. They are one and the same. And so Jesus comes preaching just as John the Baptist had preached, just as the prophets of old had preached to Israel and the nations. Repent. Have a change of thinking which leads to a change of living. Change in your attitude, your thoughts, your actions, your inactions. Look to God. You see, people like to think, well, Jesus comes on the scene and he says, hey, just forget that Old Testament stuff. Just, just forget that repentance stuff. You guys are cool. You're in. But that is not what Jesus came doing. He came preaching repent and believe in the gospel. Now, if you've already found it good, put, put, put it up on your device. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 to set the stage today. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Check this out. Very important verse. We're going to dig deep in this verse this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Here we go. The Apostle Paul writes, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Now, there are two kinds of grief. Do you see them? Mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. There's godly grief and worldly grief. Now, listen to me. True faith, saving faith, produces repentance. It is a necessary part of growing into maturity and it's a sure sign that you have been born again. Repentance, listen now, repentance reveals that God is at work deep within you, uh, working in your heart and life. It reveals that God is at work in you from the roots up. Repentance is the living fruit of redemption. Are y'all tracking with me so far? Repentance is the living fruit of redemption. Redemption. Now, the tricky thing is this. You and I, you and I, we are really good at faking the deal. We're really good at putting on those fake tears and I'm so sorry, but we don't end up seeing true lasting change in our lives. So listen to this question. So if the fruit of faith is repentance, and if the only way to change what's wrong with us is to trust Jesus, then how can you and I know? How can you and I know that our repentance is real? Uh, I have a two-point outline again this morning. This is an unusual preaching series for me to do that. But here we go. It's based on 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. This verse is very important, beloved. If you're in this room and you're not a Christian, thank you for being here. Thank you for seeking truth. Or maybe someone nags you and you just came to appease them. You're here for a reason in the balcony. You're here to study God's Word. So on your phones up in the balcony, young people, middle-aged folks, whoever you are on that balcony, on your phone, pull up a copy of Scripture and look to 2 Corinthians 7.10. I want you to see this verse. I want the weight, I want the weight of God's Word to land upon those in the balcony and to land upon those on this floor right here and those who will hear it later uh, on the internet and YouTube and all those mediums. I want us to feel the weight of God from this verse this morning. And there are two thoughts. And here they are if you jot down notes. Number one, worldly grief, worldly grief produces death. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says this at the end of that verse, whereas worldly grief produces death. Let me read the verse. For godly grief, and we're coming to that one, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, 
whereas worldly grief reduces death. Now, let me say this. Worldly grief tends to be the norm for most people. So we're in trouble already. Worldly grief tends to be the norm for most people, Christians and non-Christians alike. So let's think about four aspects, four aspects of worldly grief. And let me say this first of all about worldly grief, okay? Worldly grief is horizontal. Worldly grief is horizontal. It's less concerned about uh, being broken and more upset about getting caught. Are you with me? It's sorry for the consequences being suffered, but not necessarily sorry for what was actually done. And if you, if you have children, and everybody in this room was one at one time, so we have all lived this out, okay? We've all lived this out. But if you have children, and many of you at Crawford Baptist Church, you have children, so you understand what I mean by when I say worldly grief is horizontal. They're sorry there's now a bruise on sister's arm and the reason they're so sorry is because they got caught. It's not because they hit sister and took the candy from her or the cookie from her. They're not so because they ate the cookie and they liked the cookie. What they're sorry about is they got caught. It's like when you get caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Did you eat those chocolate chip cookies? Uh, no, sir. No, ma'am. And they got a ring of chocolate around their lips. All right? So, but have, have you not seen that in children? And by the way, that does not just phase out as we get older. We just become more sophisticated. But worldly grief is horizontal. It does not uh, acknowledge the, the, the deep roots of sin within each human being. Every human being created in the image of God. And by the way, that's every human being. We are totally depraved. We have sin which affects every area of who we are. We are dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus says in John 8, 34, whoever practices sin is the slave of sin. We can't, if we wanted to get free of our sin, we can't because of the sin condition in every human heart. And so worldly grief is horizontal. We, we aren't, we, we're not acknowledging the deep roots of sin in our own hearts, okay? And we, we, we fail to acknowledge that sin grieves the heart of God and that sin is ultimately against God. So another aspect of worldly grief is there's no acknowledgement that I have sinned against God. I may have hurt you and I got caught and I'm sorry. I'm really sorry because I got caught. But here's the deal. We have sinned against God. All of our sins are against God. But worldly grief is horizontal. It's just this way. See it here. This is the primary thing in the worship center here, the auditorium. It's vertical. We're going up to God. We're singing to God. We're learning about God. We're praising Him. We're doing all these things. Horizontal, we, we, go, we go horizontal in community groups where we interact with each other, pray for one of those needs that are shared, and we answer questions and encourage one of their, a brother or sister struggling with this situation, and you go around, which are, that's horizontal. But worldly grief never goes vertical. It only remains horizontal. Number two, worldly grief is emotional. Worldly grief is emotional. We've all seen this too. Now, maybe you didn't get caught in your sin, but the, the weight of your guilt is crushing you. Just living with knowing you did it. And the husband hasn't found out yet. The wife hasn't found out. And she has no access to that list of names from the Ashley Madison website where just, just millions of people have, have been engaged in, in illicit, immoral, sexual activity. You know, life is short, have an affair is the motto of the website, right? And so maybe you've been involved in it. You've, you've gone and checked out the site. And just the weight of that on your soul is crushing you. It makes you sick. You, you're desperate never to feel this way again. And so that weight is crushing you. You hate it. It makes you sick. There can be crying, carrying on. That sounds a lot like sincere confession. So listen. Raw emotions. Listen, folks. Raw emotions do not lead to repentance. Emotions change when your circumstances change. <clears throat> and so, yes, you're feeling conviction in the worship service as the preacher's preaching the message. You feel convicted in the community group lesson. We were in Genesis 4 this morning talking about Cain and really how we're all Cains. We're all murderers. We all slew uh, the able, who the, the ultimate able is Jesus. And so we get under conviction at times. Maybe it's in a revival service or, or whatever it would be. And so uh, you have some emotion there. But raw emotions never lead to repentance. 
not lasting repentance. Emotions change depending on the circumstances. And so the emotion that led to the heartfelt promises of God is now gone. And so, yes, you made a promise to the preacher in the front of the church or the counseling room during the revival service. But you know what? When you hit the parking lot and things happen at work and your ball team's doing this and hunting season's right around the corner and this is that and that's going on. And so your emotions change because your circumstances change. See, worldly grief is horizontal. It's just this way. It avoids God altogether. Worldly grief is also emotional. <clears throat> we can shed some tears. We can get a tissue. We can sit with a counselor. We can sit with a pastor. We can sit with a godly friend, a teacher of God's word that's impacted your life. You can, you can cry buckets, crocodile tears, I think the old preachers used to call them, and yet there's no lasting change in your life. Thirdly, worldly grief is passive. Worldly grief is passive. We, we think if we watch our sin more closely, we can keep it under control. We think if we can just watch our sin more closely, we'll be able to keep it under control. We think that we can train our sin just like a person can go train a dog to do tricks. And yet our sin is much more like a lion than it is a dog. Your sin, my sin, sin, period, is wild. It is untamable. You and I cannot master the lion of sin within our own heart. It's wild. It cannot be tamed. Worldly grief is not serious about killing sin, beloved. You know right now in your marriage, because of the, the seeds of, of doubt and, and, and lust, and, and, and the drive for uh, uh, adultery within your heart right now, you know that unless those thoughts are dealt with biblically and put to death by the power of the Spirit, that down the road you, there will be a husband or a wife who will, de who will, who will hate you. There will be kids who will look into your face and despise you because of the sinful activity that rip your home apart. And what we do is we say, well, this, you know, everybody's got some kind of sin, right? We rationalize, right? We rationalize. We make excuses. And an excuse is nothing but the skin of a lie stuck with a reason. But you see, worldly grief is passive. It doesn't take sin seriously enough to see to put it to the... If I can just not feed it as much. If I can put a chain on that sin and kind of control it, because let's just face it, every now and then when it gets really hard at home in the marriage, with the kids, with the husband, with the wife, work gets stressful. This is a release for me. Just going away and doing something radically crazy. And I know it's sin, but you know... Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Glory to God. We even baptize it with Christian language. Worldly grief is passive. It, it fails to acknowledge the seriousness of sin within us. And the fourth thing about worldly grief is it's irresponsible. We actually had this discussed in our community group this morning. You ever heard somebody say, well, I'm sorry if I upset you. I'm sorry if I may have said that about you, but, you know, what they're doing is they're shifting blame, right? See, worldly grief is, is prideful, and, and it, it, it doesn't accept responsibility nor the consequences. Blame is shifted, and the burden is put on someone or something else. That's worldly grief. Worldly grief is irresponsible. All right, you got those four things? We're getting ready to move on. All right, worldly grief is, first of all, what? Horizontal, right? Uh, secondly, a worldly grief is also emotional. Thirdly, it is passive. And fourthly, worldly grief is irresponsible. Let's think for a few moments this morning about godly grief. Look back in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Paul writes, as the Spirit of God led him to write this letter, which is now put into our Bible. Listen now. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Now here's the thing. You want to be happy. Balcony, y'all want to be happy? You're sitting in the balcony. You want to be happy? You're down here because you want to be happy. Some of you didn't want to face the stairs. It's good some of you stay down here. It's a good thing. 
No matter who you are, you want to be happy. The thing is, we Romans won God. We, 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 we think we have it figured. We think we're smarter than the deity. We think we're smarter than God himself when it comes to our lives. We think that we are the exception to the rule. Now, nobody else can get away with this, but, you know, we're different. Our family's different. I'm different. My situation's just a squeaky little bit of different than yours, so I'm going to be okay following this road that I'm choosing for myself. And so what we need to realize is there's a way which seems right to a man that it ends in death. And so God, worldly grief produces death. Godly grief, number two, produces repentance. Listen, trusting God, trusting God brings change. Faith manifests itself in repentance. <coughs> Faith turns us around from our old crooked past to follow the way of the Lord. And it's this decisive shift that not, it's not only in our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions, but, but in the overarching trajectory of our lives, okay? Let me say that again. Faith turns us around from our old crooked past to follow the way of the Lord. It's the decisive shift not only in our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our actions, but also the overarching trajectory of our lives. And there's, a, there's an English Puritan, his name is Thomas Watson. Some of you have been liking his quotations on Facebook because I put some on there earlier this morning. Some of you already liked them. Those quotes came, and I gave credit where credit is due, Thomas Watson, English Puritan. He wrote a book of 90 pages back in 1668. It's called The Doctrine of Repentance. I want to encourage you to pull that up on your phone, on your device, and at some point in time, maybe read through that document from 1668. It's called The Doctrine of Repentance. Well, how do you do that, Pastor Jay? Here's how you do it. You, you, you type in Google or Bing, type in Thomas Watson, and then The Doctrine of Repentance. If you'll then hit search, it will pull up some different things. It'll have uh, The Doctrine of Repentance PDF. And then you download that and save that, and you can read it for free. And I'm going to tell you, there are nuggets of gold in Watson's little book, The Doctrine of Repentance. There's a chapter in that book called The True Nature, uh, the, nature of tru the True Nature of Repentance. The True Nature of Repentance is the title of the chapter. And there are six things he identifies, and I really want to share these with you because they're powerful uh, and they're important for us today. So it's Thomas Watson. The Doctrine of Repentance, 1668. He said this, Repentance is a grace of God's Spirit. It is a spiritual medicine made up of six ingredients. And if you've not jotted down anything yet, let me encourage you to jot these six things down from this chapter from Thomas Watson's The Doctrine of Repentance. All right, are you with me? Again, godly grief produces a what in the text? A repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Thomas Watson writes 90 pages on repentance. And here are these points, and they are powerful. They, they will sting a little bit, and they're intended to. I'm praying, listen, beloved, we, we put on our church face. We put on some church clothes. We got our church attitude. And we come and we fake the deal. We, we pretend so much in church. It's not just Crawford Baptist Church. It's, it's any church. We, we're all surface. We don't open up about what our real struggles are. We act as if we're all perfect. Remember this. It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. That little maxim can help you find the hope and the help that you need and that I need. But listen to this. Godly grief, number one, Watson says godly grief has a sight of sin. Are you with me? Godly grief has a sight of sin. See, worldly grief, again, is horizontal. It's blind to the deep roots of sin within your own heart. And it's blind to the vertical offense of your sin against God. But think about the story in Luke 15, the prodigal son. When did he start looking back toward going home? When he came to himself, right? 
He, he, had, he got his inheritance. He said, Dad, I just wish you'd hurry up and die, but you're taking too long. And so, Dad, if you'll just give me my part of the inheritance. And he goes to what the Bible calls the far country. And, and he's got a lot of friends as long as he's buying the, 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 the wine and the booze and, and, and entertaining the women and paying for favors for his so-called friends. He's got friends. His money ran out and those so-called friends walked out. And you know the story probably. If you don't know the story, it's a beautiful story. One of the best known stories in all the Bible, Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. I mean, he ends up working for a pig farmer, which for a Jew, if you know anything about the Old Covenant, is a, is, is a big no-no. They're very unclean animals. Whether you're a Jew or not, they're very unclean animals. They do eat very well yesterday. Wasn't that good yesterday? That was good, good eating yesterday. So we thank God for the animal and what we can do with that. But I'm just telling you that, that pigs are unclean animals. And here, this... This son who, who basically said, Dad, I just wish you would die, but he wouldn't. But he still, in grace and mercy, gave his son the money he requested. He goes to the far country and he squanders it and alcohol and prostitutes and everything else. And he's completely broke. Nothing. And there, eating the food that he's supposed to be serving to the pigs, the Bible says he came to himself. The prodigal son came to himself. Thomas Watson says this, before anyone can come to Christ, he must first come to himself. You see, you have to see your sin for what it really is. God's word, the Bible, is surgical. Let me tell you, men and women and young people, this book, the Bible, is surgical. It cuts deep. It shines light into our sinful hearts to reveal our sin. The Bible serves like a spiritual PET scan. If you have a PET scan, that PET scan will cover your from top of your head to the soles of your feet, and it shows up where there might be cancer in your body. And I'm going to tell you something. The spiritual PET scan, the spiritual PET scan reveals this about you and me. Are you all listening? The spiritual PET scan reveals we have a spiritual cancer in our hearts. And there is not a surgeon on the earth, no matter how skilled or experienced, that can take out that heart of sin, spiritual cancer, and take care of your heart issue. Only Jesus can do that. That's the message of the Bible. And so work, godly grief has a sight of sin. And this is not where you point out, oh, that, that brother over there, that sister over there, and that. No, no, no. You see your sin. You know, as I read Thomas Watson this week, I was just convinced of how in our contemporary churches we don't spend time with God. We focus on so much, you know, uh, uh, again, and I, I'm as bad, I don't know how many times I've heard surveys of how many times people check their phone a day. And I was thinking about that yesterday because you know what I was doing? I was checking my phone. When I come out of the bathroom, I'll hit that, see if I got anything. Well, in between ball games on Saturday, I'll hit my phone and see if I have anything. In between classes, I check on before I come up here to preach, I see if anybody texts me something that I really need to know. If someone's had a problem, if there's a tragedy we need to pray for, I'm checking my phone all the time. Probably everybody in this room that has an iPhone, you're doing pretty much the same thing. That's what the sociological data tells us about ourselves. And maybe there's nothing wrong with a degree of that. But how, how much time do we spend with God in His Word? That, that's the ultimate issue. It's not whether you have an iPhone and that you're checking for this or that. Your reasons and motives may be extremely good in doing that. Maybe not. But I'm just I'm convinced in our heart that, that the church at large, now, there's some folks in here, man, you spend time with God, you pray, you study the Word, you're serving Christ in your home, in your community, in your children's schools, you're teaching the school and representing Christ well in the school. I mean, you're, you're living the Christ life. Rather, He's living the Christ life in you and through you, and things are going well. But a lot of folks that just come to church, they're not really taking God seriously. I think you, you won't read Thomas Watson and come away and take God lightly. You won't do that. And so the first thing is this. World, uh, godly grief. Godly grief has a sight of sin. It's your sin. Secondly, godly grief leads to sorrow for sin. Godly grief leads to sorrow for sin, Watson says. This is the embittering of the soul. 
In the Bible, when God opened men and women's eyes to see the sin that was in their own hearts, when God did that spiritual MRI, when God did that spiritual PET scan, and they were allowed to see the depravity, the sin, the blackness in their hearts, spiritually speaking, these people were appalled, horrified, grief-stricken. They experienced what would be called holy agony for their sin. It was a breaking of their hearts. When was the last time your heart was absolutely shattered because you realized the sin in you? Not in your town, not in your community, not in your church, not in your wife, not in your husband, not in your kids, not in your employer, but in you. When was the last time you sat before a holy God and allowed the Spirit of God to radiate His searchlight of holiness into your heart and you see how black and evil and depraved your heart is. You see, godly grief has a sight of sin. Godly grief then, it leads to sorrow for your sin and embittering of the soul. Thirdly, godly grief leads to confession of sin. Godly grief leads to confession of sin. After gaining sight for your sin, after gaining sight for your sin and after experiencing sorrow over your sin, the worst thing you can do is to hide your sin hoping no one ever really finds out who you really are. True, listen, true, true sorrow over sin, it begs to be vented. That's a word from Watson. True sorrow over sin begs to be vented both vertically to God and horizontally to others that you may have sinned against and wounded. So listen, mark this down, beloved. Mark this down. Listen to this. Mark this down. You have no shot. You have no shot of experiencing peace, freedom, change, and love if you are habitually protecting your image and pretending that you're perfect. Let me say that again. You have no shot at experiencing real peace, freedom, change, and love if you're habitually protecting your image and pretending you're perfect. Psalm 32, verse 5, says that the psalmist David there says, I confess my sins to the Lord. When was the last time you did that? You agreed with God. I've sinned. I've lusted. I've cheated. I've I've been smart, allocated with mom and dad. I cheated on the quiz at school. I've been having lustful thoughts over that boy. I went to a place. Mom and dad thought I was over here and I was over somewhere else altogether they did not approve of. Okay, that's a sin. Right? David, Psalm 32, 5, he confessed his sins to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And think about this. He already knows how bad you are. He knows that you got your hand in the cookie jar. Even if you have no crumbs on your shirt and no chocolate ring around your lips, He knows what you're guilty of. And the remedy through Christ is if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, confession is to go vertical to God. The psalm is Psalm 32, 5, 1 John 1, 9, confessing your sins to God. But then James 5, 16 says confess your sins to one another. James 5, 16 says confess your sins to one another. That is, if you have sinned against somebody, confess that sin to that person. Go to that person and ask for forgiveness. And by the way, don't do the worldly grief irresponsible. Well, I'm sorry if I said that about your kid. Yes, you said it about the kid. Yes, you did that. Yes, you meant it to hurt. Just own up to our sin. We have to do that, beloved. We are playing games with God, and you're playing games with yourself when all you do is deal with worldly grief. It is horizontal. It is emotional. It is passive. It's not trying to put sin to death in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is irresponsible. You pass the book. So godly grief 
as sight of sin, your sin. Godly grief leads to sorrow for sin, your sin. Godly grief leads to confession of sin. Are you tracking? Here comes number four. All right, we've got three of them now, three to go. And we're done. You're listening well. Here we go. Number four. Godly grief produces shame for sin. Godly grief produces shame for sin. I love this. Blushing, blushing is the color of virtue. Thomas Watson wrote this. When the heart has been made black with sin, grace makes the face red with blushing. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? This godly shame is a deep regret that steers you and me out of sin and back toward the path leading to life. And so number four, godly grief produces shame for sin. All right, so we have a sight for sin, right? What was number two? We have a sight for sin. We have what? Sorrow for our sin, which then led to number three. We confess that sin to God. Number four, there's a godly grief which produces shame for sin. Watson writes about. Number five, godly grief produces a hatred of sin. Godly grief produces a hatred of sin. If a person loathes that which makes his stomach sick, Watson writes, much more will he loathe that which makes his soul sick. Are you following with me? I mean, you don't like stuff. If you, if you, if you take something going to give you an upset stomach, you're not going to like that, I hope. That's what he's saying here. If a person loathes, hates, detests which makes it, that which makes his stomach sick, even more so will he loathe or hate or detest that which makes his soul sick. We need a holy hatred of our sin. Father, give me a holy hatred for pride, for lust, for a smart alecky mouth. Lord, for always being focused on me. You fill in the blank. Everybody, every one of us, Christian, non-Christian likes, we have sins in our minds, deep in our hearts, and they burst forth. What's down the wells coming up in the bucket. Saved or not, we still fall short of the glory of God. And there's grace for us. But I'm going to tell you, we ought to have a holy hatred for our sin. Don't pamper it. Don't try to train it. Don't try to control it. <coughs> Put it to death. That's what the Bible would say. Colossians 3. The sixth thing Watson writes about godly grief. The sixth thing is godly grief leads to a turning from sin. True repentance, like acid, eats asunder the iron chain of sin. I love that quote. True repentance, like acid, eats asunder the iron chain of sin. It is a forsaking of sin. The turning from sin implies a great change. It's wrought in the heart, and it appears in the life. And I love this quote. I love this quote that Watson has. Repentance makes it appear as if another soul is lodged in the same body. Does that make sense? Repentance makes it appear as if another soul is lodged in the same body. What he means by that is, when you truly repent and you begin living a lifestyle of repentance, what he's saying is it looks like there's a new you inside. Are you with me on that? These are six essential ingredients. Watson says if you leave any of those six out, you don't have true biblical repentance. Godly grief, godly grief, you see, uh, has a sight of sin. It leads to sorrow for sin. It leads to confession of sin. It produces shame for sin. It produces a hatred of sin. It, and it leads to a turning away from sin in your life. Now, let me say this. You can't do this in your own strength. Jesus has said in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Even Christians in their own strength can do this. Jesus has said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And so the 
gospel, listen to me, brothers and sisters, if you're Christians, rejoice in the gospel. If you're here and you're not a Christian yet, we're praying for you this morning. We're so happy you're here in this place of worship of Jesus Christ. Listen, here's the gospel. The gospel is the good news that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopeless and sinful people and he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against our sin on the cross so that everyone who believes in him, Jesus, can be reconciled to the Father forever. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. On that cross, look at that cross up there on the wall, just depicting the cross. But on the cross of Jesus, and there's only one of those, on the cross of Jesus, God's perfect justice was poured out on that cross. And on that cross, God's perfect mercy was poured out on that cross. At the same time, as Jesus was nailed to it in agony, writhing in pain, paying the penalty of sinners so that you could, as we're going to study next week, be justified and adopted into the family of God. That's the gospel. I heard a great story this week from a pastor, J.D. Greer. I wanted to share this as I close. A gentleman told him the story. He was in his study at home. He was a pastor. He was in his study at home having a meeting with someone. And all of a sudden, he heard just a crashing sound that went on for more than five seconds. It, it must have been 20 to 30 seconds. Just, just a continual, <coughs> that kind of thing. Just things breaking, shattering. And so this dad, he, he jumps up out of his chair in the study. He runs down the hallway to the kitchen. And when he enters into the kitchen, he sees that his 12-year-old girl is surrounded by about 10 feet of shattered uh, uh, crystal and china plates and cups and dishes and saucers all around her. She's covered uh, by a circle of like a 10-feet circle, they say in the story, of all these shattered heirlooms and pieces of china that's been passed down in their families for generations. Thousands of dollars worth of dishes and goblins and go goblets and cups and all those things. <laughs> not goblets. Hopefully not goblins. Uh, but all that came crashing down. And what happened was this 12-year girl, she knew the rules. She's not supposed to do that. But she was climbing up on, the, on this china cabinet. She was getting up to like the top shelf of where it was, trying to get something from the top shelf of all things. And she pushed her weight on it, and that top shelf gave way. And everything on the top shelf came down to the next shelf, and 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 the next shelf. And, next shelf. and everything fell down and broke and shattered around her. And as dad runs into the room, he sees all the broken pieces and shards of glass and sharp objects. He sees blood on his daughter's face and on her legs and on her arms. It's a big bruise on her head. And, 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 and she's surrounded by all this sharp, broken glass and crystal. And so he looks at her and he says, well, just look at this mess you've gotten yourself into. You knew better than to do that. You got yourself into this mess. You figure out a way to get this mess cleaned up. And when you do, you report promptly to my office and we'll discuss your penalty, your, your, your punishment. And this pastor telling the story to Pastor J.D. Greer said, of course that's not what I said to my little girl. I said, baby doll, sweetheart, are you okay? She's crying. She's bleeding. Bruise on her forehead. Dripping blood from her arms, her feet, her cut. And she says, I'm all right, Dad. Look what I did. He says, baby, don't worry. Let me go get a broom. He goes and gets a broom. And this dad, he sweeps off a path of, of the broken plates and glasses and all those things. He makes a pathway to her in the center of that little circle of broken pieces, thousands of dollars worth of, of stuff. And he gets to that circle with his little baby girl, 12 years old, and he picks her up and he holds her and he hugs her and he kisses her on the forehead and he takes her out of that, that circle through the path he had made back out to get her patched up and fixed up. But here's the thing. Every religion on planet Earth, every 
religion on planet Earth is going to say, look at the mess you're in. Now you fix this mess and when you make it out of here and report to me, we'll see if I let you in or not. That is every religion on the planet. That is not Christianity. Because when you had no way or even desire to go to him, he came for you. And he has swept through all the brokenness of our lives, all the guilt, the shame, the fear, and in the person of Jesus, nailed to a cross, rescuing you, redeeming you from the shatteredness of your own this morning, I'm here as a good news gospel preacher to tell you if you are here and you want to talk more about salvation, if you have the Holy Spirit working in your heart, urging you to trust Christ, maybe you recently trusted Jesus and you want to make that public, you want to come and, and make things known to this faith family, or maybe you don't want to do that, but you just want to come and pray. Uh, uh, Pastor Nate is here. He's going to help us today. Uh, Pastor Glad is going to be, I think, uh, maybe coming down as well, but we have some men that will pray with you right here at the front. We'll do that. Here's the thing. If you want Christ today, Jesus Christ died for sinners. Let me tell you already, you qualify. We all do for all the sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one on his own seeks for God. Romans 3, 10, 11. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Romans 6, 23. The only remedy for that spiritual cancer in your heart is not you trying to do better. Remember, we've already studied this two sermons ago. It's not a better you. It's not looking for somebody to somebody else to make you better. Right? It's not looking to the things of the world to appease the hurt and the ache and the emptiness in your soul. And it's not even religion. Religion tells you, you do better. You find a way to get to me. Christianity, God became a man. Lived the perfect life. The perfect one who never sinned, died for sinners on the cross. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that sons of men can be born again and become sons and daughters of God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning if you're in this room and you... If you need salvation or if you have recently trusted Christ, or maybe this morning you just say, Jesus, that's me. I'm a wreck. I I'm messed up. My life is shattered because of sin and choices I've made. Jesus, save me. Pray that prayer. Would you do that? Would you pray that prayer? Move in hearts and lives. If God's moving your heart, then you move. And come and speak with one of us here at the front this morning. And again, this message today is for Christians and non-Christians. Godly grief has a sight of sin. I'm praying that, that for me and for us as believers, Christians, we will, we will go deeper with God in our own lives, in our own hearts, and within our homes, in our marriages, with our children, children with our parents. We're, we're praying today for God to, to, to grant repentance. 2 Timothy 2, 24. It's something He grants to us. And Father, would you grant repentance, a repentance that has a sight of sin, our sin, and God, would you, would you give us a, a sorrow, a, an embittering within our souls for sin, God? And God, would you grant us the, the grace to confess and to agree with you? And Lord, if we need to go to somebody else and make it right and ask for their forgiveness, God, give us the grace to do that. Oh, God, work. Work in our hearts, Lord. Help us. Have a holy hatred of our sin. Turn from our sin. Give us that ability to blush again when the heart is blackened by sin. It's the grace of God that enables the face to be red with shame. God, these are graces from you that wake us up to the evil and sin in our own heart. The heart is the secret above all things, desperately sick. Who can even know his own heart? Our hearts lie to us all the time. Oh, God, by grace, would you give us victory today. Give us that sight to see, hearts to respond.